No event better sums up the intense division in American politics right now than the January 6th insurrection, when Donald Trump supporters stormed the Capitol building. That attack followed tweets the former president sent out that called into question the integrity of the 2020 U.S. election, plus a speech on the same day in which he told supporters, "We fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore." Now, a House special committee has convened to investigate what went on. Here's what you need to know: Four police officers have given powerful testimonies about their experiences to the U.S. House of Representatives investigatory committee established to investigate the January 6th Capitol insurrection, according to Reuters. The officers provided examples of violence they experienced themselves and witnessed firsthand, with one of them saying he heard rioters chant that they wanted to kill him with his own gun, according to CNN. Another officer, who is black, recalled repeated instances of racism, describing how one woman had called him the N-word, which prompted other rioters to do the same. According to the BBC, on the day of the insurrection, rioters broke past police lines and got within 100 feet or 30 meters of Vice President Mike Pence, whom they said they wanted hanged. One rioter was shot dead by security forces, and senators were forced to abandon confirmation of Joe Biden's 2020 election victory. According to CNN, it is now likely the committee will place the blame for inciting these events on former President Trump, an idea reflected by a majority of Americans in the days that followed. An Ipsos poll showed 67% of the overall population held Trump responsible for inciting the insurrection, with 31% of Republicans sharing that belief and 98% of Democrats. As they reflected on the implications of the insurrection, the police officers in Tuesday's committee hearing referred to those involved as terrorists. Called the attack on the Capitol an attempted coup and characterized their own efforts as a battle for human decency. Of course, in the background, every aspect of this committee's work is fiercely contested. The committee only exists because two months ago, Senate Republicans blocked a bipartisan plan to create an independent commission to investigate the insurrection. What's more, it is now made up of just two Republican members and seven Democrats because Democratic House Speaker Nancy Pelosi rejected two of the five Republican nominations from House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. McCarthy responded by withdrawing the remaining two, leaving Pelosi to choose two strongly anti-Trump Republicans as members instead. The two rejected Republicans were Jim Jordan and Jim Banks, both known as Trump allies, who deny his role in the attack and objected to the ratification of Biden's win. However, their rejection has provided leading Republicans with the opportunity to dismiss the committee as partisan gamesmanship. House Minority Leader McCarthy called it an abuse of power on Pelosi's part, adding that she had broken this institution. Meanwhile, Jim Banks of Indiana, one of the Republicans Pelosi rejected, claimed the speaker cherry-picked the members and has pre-written a narrative. These comments may indeed have some merit, though coming from a group of people who have demonstrated partisan behavior themselves time and again, few will take them seriously. However, there are far more bizarre comments also coming out of leading Republicans regarding events on January 6th. In a departure from reality that has been widely mocked, Representative Andrew Clyde, a Republican from Georgia, used a May congressional hearing to claim the attack looked like a normal tourist visit. Watching the TV footage of those who entered the Capitol and walked through Statuary Hall showed people in an orderly fashion staying between the stanchions and ropes, taking videos and pictures. He said, according to CNN, "You know, if you didn't know the TV footage was a video from January the sixth, you would actually think it was a normal tourist visit." He added, raising serious unresolved questions about what he believes tourism involves and where he has been going on vacation. Along similarly deranged lines are claims from several high-ranking Republicans that the breach of the Capitol building was actually Speaker Nancy Pelosi's fault because security is her responsibility. There's questions into the leadership within the structure of the Speaker's office, where they denied the ability to bring the National Guard here. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy said, according to CNN, there are questions about why Speaker Pelosi didn't make sure that Capitol Police had all the tools they needed to be prepared for that day. House Republican Whip Steve Scalise said, also according to CNN, Nancy Pelosi bears responsibility as Speaker of the House for the tragedy that occurred on January 6th. Representative Elise Stefanik, the number three Republican in the House, claimed even more definitively. Unfortunately for these guys, as the CEO of the U.S. Capitol Historical Society told CNN, the Speaker of the House does not oversee security of the U.S. Capitol, nor does this official oversee the Capitol Police Board. So each of those claims is either a total fantasy or cynical games playing from people willing to say anything to hold on to power. 
Either way, the events that they are tediously dressing up with obvious falsehoods remain a serious misstep in American history that do warrant investigating further, as much for what they mean for the future as for what they meant to the past. One of the police officers speaking to the committee on Tuesday said that the rioters he came across localized white nationalist ideas, noting that there were many white supremacist-linked organizations at the Capitol on that day. In that context, debating the makeup of a committee and spuriously spinning stories about Nancy Pelosi's role in it, all is surely more than standard partisan maneuvering, is playing inside baseball while literal white supremacists storm the Capitol. Surely, these politicians should have at least something to say about the actual circumstances around an event so significant to their country. Is it not slightly embarrassing to be so vacuous and to have nothing to say about its causes or what it tells us about the state of the U.S. right now? Also, if you want actual evidence of a partisan agenda against Trump, you might be better placed talking about the charges filed against his company and top advisor last month. The Trump Organization has been indicted by New York State prosecutors for what the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has called a sweeping and audacious illegal payment scheme, according to the New York Times. Here are the details. On Thursday, New York prosecutors released a 15-count indictment sheet charging the Trump Organization and its chief financial officer, Alan Weiselberg, with the crime of scheme to defraud in the first degree. The New York Times summarized that Weiselberg is accused of concealing $1.7 million of taxable income by not declaring fringe benefits. The largest of these benefits listed in the court document is an apartment on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Prosecutors from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and the New York Attorney General allege that the Trump Organization paid rent and related expenses of $1.17 million on an apartment without declaring it as income to tax authorities. In addition, the document alleges the company paid $196,245 towards lease payments on Mercedes-Benz cars for Weisselberg and his wife, plus $359,058 in tuition fees for Weisselberg family members and ad hoc personal expenses to Weisselberg, going towards new beds, flat screen televisions, carpet installation, and furniture for Weisselberg's home in Florida. In total, it is alleged that Weiselberg evaded $556,385 in federal taxes, $106,568 in state taxes, and $238,159 in New York City taxes through the same scheme. He also claimed $94,902 in federal tax refunds and $38,222 in state tax refunds to which he wasn't entitled. He has pleaded not guilty. According to Vox, there is somewhat of an ulterior motive behind these charges. Weiselberg has worked for the Trump family since the 1970s and, according to one Trump biographer, knows where all the financial bodies are buried. With this in mind, prosecutors have been trying for months to flip Weiselberg so he can operate as a cooperating witness against the Trump organization. These charges are recognition that they have so far not succeeded in doing so. However, the broader agenda appears relatively transparent. These are the first charges brought as part of Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance Jr.'s wider investigation into the former president's company, which is also looking into hush money allegedly paid to women who had sexual relations with Trump and claims of real estate price manipulation. If Weiselberg were to act as a witness against Trump, any possible tax, insurance, or bank fraud case against the former president would likely be easier to make, according to Vox. Why does this matter? Firstly, for the Trump Organization, it could mean further financial difficulties. The Trump Organization already has about $900 million of debt due to be repaid over the next four years, according to the Financial Times, about a third of which is personally guaranteed by Trump. However, the bigger picture is that any charges against himself or his company make it more difficult for Trump to win if he runs for president in 2024. Trump has already begun a series of campaign-style political rallies and may be positioning himself for another run at the presidency, according to The Guardian. Vox explains that many of Trump's opponents could see these legal battles as a way of putting obstacles between Trump and that run. The Trump Organization certainly feels this lies behind Wednesday's indictment, saying in a press statement reprinted by CNN, this is not justice, this is politics. Trump's lawyer echoed these sentiments, calling it a sad day for the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. After years of investigation and the collection of millions of documents and devoting the resources of dozens of prosecutors and outside consultants, this is all they have, he said. 
The New York Times thinks he may have a point. It is highly unusual for prosecutors to indict a company for failing to pay payroll taxes on fringe benefits alone, it said. Alongside this, it has also been widely observed that the two people in charge of the investigation, Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance and New York State Attorney General Letitia James, are both Democrats. Speaking to the New York Times, Trump himself called the accusations against his company a continuation of the witch hunt that started when I came down the escalator, referring to his 2015 announcement that he would run for president for the first time. For more news animations and explainers, hit the subscribe and bell button to join the Tomo News family. Thanks for watching.